Hello, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to the Liberty Report. Co-host today, Daniel McAdams, is with us. Thank you for being here, Daniel. How are you, Dr. Paul? Doing fine Great. and uh, have an interesting subject today. It's not totally new. It's repetitious, but it's not good news, uh, really, for uh, consistency in, in United States foreign policy. Yeah. Matter of fact, it's a report that, uh, in, in spite of our criticism of internationalism of everything, uh, it's a report that came out last week by IAEA and, and the uh, inspector general from from the agency is reporting back on Iran on whether or not they are in compliance. Our president disagrees. He's arguing about all this. But the report actually comes in and reminds us of the time uh, when the reports from the IAEA came in on Iraq. And we said, <laughs> Saddam Hussein is not doing this. Don't go to war. It's not true. But here, here the report comes in, and they're saying they're in that uh, that Iran is in complete compliance uh, with this, which, um, you know, and this report was just less than a week ago, uh, and yet Trump has taken the position before this report came out. And uh, I don't think they've ever been blatant and say they're not in compliance, they're not in compliance, and I think that was Tillerson's position too. But in a way, they're saying this because they're saying, well, what about this and what about that? And they want to extend the requirements on the agreement. And uh, right now, we're sort of sidelined from this. You know, the, the P5 plus one plus the United Nations uh, are sticking by uh, the argument that, um, you know, Iran is not... Uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, violating their their agreement. So this this is interesting, and and yet uh, it, it's a subject that not too many people would in the United States will agree with us on. They're probably going to argue, well, you can't trust them, you can't trust them, they're bad people, and they want to go on and on. Uh, but uh, to me, it's uh, the people who are saying this are the war propagandists. They they like war or threat of war, potential war, because it's good for business. Yeah. I think that's what's been going on. But it's interesting that the president stands alone on this, and uh, where he left it a few weeks ago was sort of in limbo. He says, I am not going to comply. I am not going to sign off that they are in compliance. I won't say they're not in compliance. Yeah. So it, it's sort of in limbo, and then he, he sort of threw it back to Congress, which theoretically is okay, but in the practical matter, the, the, the U.S. Congress uh, uh, didn't have a whole lot to do with this. You know, it wasn't actually a treaty. Well, the U.S. doesn't have a leg to stand on. Trump doesn't have a leg to stand on because they're either in compliance. The, the, the treaty, the deal uh, is pretty specific and pretty concise. They are either in compliance with that or they're not. And so Trump, I think, understands that there's nothing he can point to to say, okay, they're not doing this that they said they would do. Uh, so he has to say that, well, they're not complying with the spirit of the agreement. And, and nobody knows what that means. What, what is a spirit? It's, yeah, uh, it's he, a vague... He, he's not complying with the things we think he should do anyway. Yeah. You know, and uh, it reminds us, of course, of uh, how Scott Ritter talked to us, not only back uh, leading up to the Iraq war, because he had this position of uh, the chairman of this investigation and always said that Saddam Hussein was living up to his, his promises. But even recently, uh, Scott's been on this program. He was mm -hmm. at our conference. He says they're doing the same thing again. And uh, in, in, in a way, what uh, Trump is saying, well, they're not looking at every military uh, assembly, you know, a, a operation. They have every everything is military. They have to have it had nothing to do with the agreement, and there's no reason anybody is assuming or could say, oh yeah, uh, these uh, uh, these military sites that they have, they they might be working on a bomb. But you know, it, it reminds me of, of the saying, which is a, a very legitimate in most cases, and that is, how do you prove a negative? Yeah. You know, how can you prove that not a single square foot of land in Iran? could be used, you know, for uh, for building something nuclear. It doesn't, it means that it might be impossible to say, yeah, we, we inspected every inch, but the way they set up these agreements, they're reasonable, and if outsiders can come in and look at it, and they're honest inspectors, we should be able to get some information. It didn't help 
you know, leading up to Iraq war. And right now, who knows what's happening? I think we've lost a little bit of credibility on this. I don't think that uh, the whole world is is jumping on. The P5 is P4 plus one. Yeah. And they're still, and Europe is trading <laughs> with Iran. So I don't think they're going to join us. And as tough of, uh, of a person that uh, Trump is and taking a strong stance, um, I'm not so sure that we're uh, we're operating in this area as a, as a as a government of a, of substantial force and uh, reputation. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. Yeah, and I think Scott Ritter absolutely nailed it. First of all, he's been there and done that. He was a chief weapons inspector for the UN when it came to Iraq. So he saw the buildup. He saw the neocon lies leading up to the war, and he warned us both on this show when we had him on, and also he spoke at our conference, as you remember, in Washington, the Ron Paul Institute conference in September, and he said this is exactly what they're going to do. They're going to keep, the U.S. is going to keep ramping up demands, imaginary artificial demands, and they'll keep doing it and keep doing it until the point where Iran says, no, hold on, we're not going to allow that to happen. Then the U.S. will scream, uh, you know, refusal, not in compliance. That's exactly what Nikki Haley did toward the end of September, just a couple of weeks after Scott warned us. Uh, she said that, um, well, they're not allowing us into all of their sites. Uh, they're, they're not complying because they're not letting us go everywhere. When that was never part of the deal, it wasn't in the agreement. But they're trying to basically replay the Iraq war. They're doing it over. They're so shameless. They're replaying the Iraq war and hoping no one notices. Well, it then raises the questions, what's behind this? You know, sometimes people say, follow the money. Is there money involved in this? There may well be some money involved in this. Oil's involved. Uh, uh, militarism is involved. Military industrial complex. All these things are involved. But then there be, then there's strategic allies that are involved. And probably the closest ally we have that's uh, cheering us on would probably be a Saudi Arabia. Yeah. I mean, they, that's their arch enemy has been going on for long time. And I don't think Israel's going to object to uh, Trump's position on this as well. So those that's the background noise that may be the motivating factor, even though it makes no sense. Now, um, th th this, this uh, of course, uh, raises the question, what should the American people know about and what should they believe? Because, uh, you know, if, if it's in a hush-hush manner and, you, and they don't know, uh, they're liable to capitulate and not pay much attention, and, and then uh, not only will we be uh, allies of Saudi Arabia and Yemen, uh, maybe we'll be allies with uh, uh, Saudi Arabia in, a, in another uh, geographic area. Yeah, and I think there's nothing that the Saudis and Israelis would like more than to have us do their fighting for them, to have the U.S. go in and start a war with Iran without understanding what it would be a catastrophic war uh, for Saudi Arabia and possibly for Israel. You know, Iran takes out the oil fields. That's the only game that the Saudis have going in town. But you made a point earlier that I think is really interesting and worth exploring, which is that Trump's position on the Iran deal, because the allies in Europe are not following it as they were expected to, the President Trump is actually isolating the U.S. Uh, from the rest of the world. He is the isolationist. I thought we were supposed to be the isolationist. <laughs> but he's isolating. He's making the U.S. less relevant uh, in, in the bigger scheme of things. That would be fine if we had no obligations and we had no intention on, you know, beefing up the forces and being available and putting on sanctions and enforcing them. I think that kind of intervention is alive as well. But yeah. the isolation part, I think, is a good point. But, you know, um, sorting all this out and letting the people know what is true and, and whether the Iranians are really, uh, you know, in violation, that, that's, that's one issue. But um, th there's another issue that's going on right now that uh, I think uh, is built on deception to the American people, and that is how many troops do we have in which countries? You know, they have reports that you can look into it, and I was uh, pretty shocked to find out that you can figure out uh, certain countries, uh, where they are, and uh, yet there's 29,000 that we don't even know where they are. They're <laughs> not in this country. They're out, but they're not reported to the public. They don't know exactly where they are. And the reason this came up, uh, anti-war has some good reports on this, and uh, they they point out that what is reported is that we have like 500 troops in in Syria, which we're not supposed. What what is legally supposed to be there, like zero? Zero. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we have we own Iraq, so to speak. So there's uh, uh, more than 5,000 there, but. 
uh, what uh, what in recent reports when it's dissected out, instead of 500, there's actually 1,700 uh, in Syria and almost 9,000 in in Iraq. But that's not re reported. But the uh, assumption is is that uh, Trump has no problem with this. As a matter of fact. He doesn't think it should be reported. The enemy doesn't know how much troops we have and where they are, and uh, we should keep this secret, keep them off balance. But the problem is, if the enemy uh, is the group that's not supposed to have this, why are we, the American people, incorporated into the enemy? <laughs> you know, and, and even it's difficult for some of members of Congress. Remember, the members of Congress didn't know we had troops in Nigeria, and it turns out there 52 countries in, yeah. in Africa. We own Africa, too, <laughs> in, in, in essence. So uh, this idea that we're keeping our enemies off balance, when did they become our enemies? You know, uh, uh, did they attack us? Have they bombed us? Have they invaded us? Have they put sanctions on us? No, they haven't done any of these things, but they're the enemies, and they better not know where our troops are. Uh, who knows? We might have CIA agents in, in uh, Iran, for all we know. And the idea that we're not allowed to have any idea where the U.S. military is fighting in our name is preposterous if we're supposed to be living in a free country. But uh, you probably saw this. There was a great press conference, really funny. Uh, the spokesman for the uh, U.S. troops in Syria, uh, he was asked a question at a press conference. Uh, how many troops do we have in Syria? He said, well, we have about 2,500. They said, oh, that's interesting because you're only claiming 500. <laughs> He said, did I say 2,500? I misspoke. I meant 500. <laughs> you know, it was, <laughs> no, he's higher than what this figure is that yeah. they just dug up. So and, uh, They could be part of that 29,000. We don't even know. And that comes out to be 10% of, uh, of all our troops. Yeah. They have no idea where they are. Well, well somebody has an idea where. So. <laughs> and then that probably doesn't involve. Those are military troops. That doesn't probably... Special forces might not be included, but the CIA won't be included. And then you have State Department officials at embassies around the world that are very much involved, uh, you know, almost like a troops on the ground type of thing. So yeah. there's so much information that we, we don't have, and it's all endorsed by people who believe in intervention, and they believe it in a moral, constitutional sense. I believe they're serious. They're completely wrong, but we have, they claim we have this obligation to be there because we are the peacemakers of the world and we don't want anything bad to happen but when you look at this uh, there's a bit of deception going on and they ought to be exposed and I think we have a right to wonder what are the US troops doing in Syria we were told in 2014 by President Obama we are going in to take out ISIS President Trump used even more colorful language saying we're gonna wipe ISIS away well ISIS is gone they've been defeated in Syria the last village was taken from ISIS they're gone so why do we maintain troops there? What's the real What's the real target? What's the real goal? You know, in, in economics, there's two uh, poles on this. One is total uh, authoritarianism, communism, and socialism. And then the other side is uh, laissez-faire, uh, free markets. And um, in between, um, you, you know, this this management style is supposed to be it can be called utilitarianism uh, and pragmatism, and that in itself is a philosophy in economics. Well, in, in, in foreign policy, that's similar. They might be part of the realists and all that. We, will, we realize that the extremes of, of uh, isolationism is bad and extremes of authoritarianism is bad. But if they're utilitarians and, uh, and they look at it this way and they're realistic, why can't they use the uh, successes and the failures to guide their policy? <laughs> is, do, do they have many successes in the, since 9-11 to show that we have done something good for our country? Yeah, in what way is the Middle East better now than when we first started, say even in 1990 or 91? How is it better? Like point to one, to one point that's better than it was before. And could it be actually a negative? Could, uh, you know, people like uh, Iran, their so-called enemies, seems like they're winning the wars, and and everybody's turned against Russia. Russia, they're bad people again. So, but guess what? They're sorting things out. And right now, uh, you know, there's been a report that uh, Putin may be involved in in bringing the um, the Syrians and Israelis together. That wouldn't to be too bad of a, <laughs> yeah. of, a of a deal like that. But in in many ways. 
the evidence is just lying out there. The, the Iraq war is so dramatically negative, and what what good have uh, uh, has has come of the uh, Afghanistan war? But that never seems to say, well, maybe maybe our theories are wrong. Maybe it's, wrong, it's something, wrong. and they'll say you're right, Ron. That's true. We're, we never fight to win. Yeah. We never have enough troops. They're still fighting Vietnam. Yeah, yeah we had. 500,000 there, but we never had enough troops. That's why we had to walk away and admit defeat, and then all those capitals came in and they <laughs> took over. You know, we were supposed to stop the spread of communism, but after we left, of course, it became more capitalistic. Yeah, they say we're leading from behind. We gotta yeah, lead from the forward. Go. But I would just say, if I, can, if I can wind it up, that I would say watch Nikki Haley, because Nikki Haley <laughs> is the key point I think also Wes Mitchell, who's doing the State Department's Europe stuff, he's going to be twisting some arms. Nikki Haley's going to be twisting some arms. I think it's a positive thing, as we pointed out, that the U.S. has become slightly irrelevant. Uh, we're not playing by the right rules, and so they're going to ignore us. That's a positive thing. That might send a good lesson. No, I hope, I hope uh, they get the lesson, and then that would lead to uh, maybe... Uh, thinking about a non-intervention or, or a lot less intervention uh, type of foreign policy, and that would be very helpful. And it would also help the budget here and there, it would also help the dis, uh, discrepancy and the wealth distribution. Uh, when you see the giant uh, military corporations uh, making uh, hundreds of millions and billions of dollars, it would, it would be a real challenge. And just, just think, if the, if the policy changed, uh, they, uh, and, and those people argue, well, foreign, foreign expenditures and war expenditures is good for the economy, which is a bunch of baloney. <laughs> it is not true. It's a distraction from the people having the money to spend it the way they want to, and that's also uh, contributes to the wealth uh, maldistribution. And that's the reason, uh, most of the reason, or part of the reason why 50% of the people in this country have the equivalent wealth of three top uh, billionaires, hundred billion dollars, you know. And that, uh, that is all a consequence of this. So if the money were not to be spent overseas in a wasteful manner, uh, fighting wars that shouldn't exist, uh, more money would be in the pockets of the people here at home, and uh, maybe there would be less complaints about, uh, you know, the problems of, uh, of uh, the super wealthy and the super poor. Because certainly our economy, though the government statistics right now are saying it's great and wonderful, uh, is not a reflection of what a free market economy would be all about if you had balanced budgets and, and sound money. It doesn't resemble in any way. Everything is is precarious and, uh, and, and, and even in spite of good statistics now, it's not built on sound economic policy and there's not a sound foundation. So there's every, a lot of good reasons to think about foreign policy. Think about it also with civil liberties under the conditions of war. That's one of the first things they do. Even before we went to Iraq, we passed the Patriot Act. We had to attack the American people. Yes, we also started TSA. And virtually the undermining of liberties at home may be the most expensive uh, loss that we have is the loss of liberty at home, making it more difficult for to fight the intellectual battles. And just look at how restrictions on freedom of expression it has encroached even into the Internet, where we have to be very, very cautious about being able to get our message out. So there's good reason to become not non-intervention and support it and understand it and make sure that we only support those individuals in Washington who actually believe and know and understand what non-intervention is all about. And it doesn't involve keeping the information away from the enemy, which includes the American people. No, I think we need a free and open society. We would become more prosperous and we would become much safer. I want to thank everybody for tuning in today to the Liberty Report. Please come back soon.